and good afternoon. And on behalf of, uh, of ASIFMA and Smart Stream Technologies, I would like to welcome you all to this to this webinar. My name is Philippe Dirks, and I'm heading the fixed income division at, uh, at ASIFMA. Uh, we are an independent regional trade organization for the ones who do know us, who do not know us. Uh, we have uh, representing over 150 members, bank brokers, uh, asset managers, low and consulting firms, and technology and market uh, infrastructure service providers. Uh, we are the voice of our members uh, and as we promote and advocate for a liquid, deep and broad capital, capital market, but also a stable, competitive and, and efficient one. So uh, intraday liquidity. Um, since the uh, global financial crisis, the regulatory framework has evolved significantly requiring a financial institution to measure, monitor, report their exposure, both from a credit market and liquidity, a liquidity perspective. And this has a significant impact on these financial institutions, could be from a balance sheet and capital point of view. And that has led them to review their risk management tools, their reassessing their operating model and optimizing their, their, cash, their cash management. Uh, and the topic is even becoming more uh, relevant today with interest rates uh, expected to rise over the next of the next year or so, uh, but also in the framework of in the context of the pandemic that has brought major challenges and pressure on banks, their client, but also as we've seen recently on the on the supplies change on the supply chains. Uh, so um, today's webinar we will explore what we thought are some key aspects of intraday liquidity uh, management. So we're going to start with the regulatory frame, framework and the cost of intraday liquidity. Then we look at the impediment for financial institutions in their day-to-day -day liquidity management uh, and the required capability for optimizing that intraday liquidity management. Um, we also discuss the evolution of payment uh, architectures, could it be DLT, CBDC, real time, and what's the impact on that on liquidity, on liquidity management? And finally, we're going to explore how technologies and platform can lead to operational ex uh, excellence. So, to uh, to discuss these uh, these points, we have a great panel of experts uh, for you today. So, we have Keith Desouza, who's the executive director, of liquidity and funding at uh, DBS. Keith, thank you for for being here. Uh, we have Simon Gray. Simon is partner at Baringa Partners and he's based in London. Simon, welcome. And uh, we have uh, Nadim Shamin, who's the global head of cash and liquidity at Smart Stream Technologies, uh, the co host of this webinar. Nadim, thank you. And you're also in London with the beautiful Gherkin in the background. <laughs> yeah. So, a little bit of logistic before we start. Um, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So feel free to use that to log in your, your questions. Um, we will do our best either during the session as we, as we, as we can monitor the, uh, the questions, uh, either going through this question as we, as we dis, uh, through our discussions or at the end of the, of the webinar. So we're gonna block 10 to around 10 minutes for, for that. Also, uh, to be clear, the questions that you log into the Q&A box are only visible to the, to the, to the panelists, to myself and the, and the panelists, and not to the other people in the order. So do not be shy to post your comments and questions. Um, uh, nobody else than us will, will see it. Okay, so, so with that, without further ado, let's, let's now dive into the conversation and, and we want this conversation to be to be dynamic. So, uh, each of you, please, uh, gentlemen, to um, chip in whenever you find it uh, necessary or, or, or relevant. But let's start with you, Simon, and and let's look at at the a bit of, of of the backdrop. So, what brought us to this point from a regulatory point of view? Sure. Yes. Uh, so I guess I guess back in uh, in two thousand eight, there was a there was a financial crisis, obviously, that brought to light some of the challenges around intraday. It had been on 
on some of the on the agenda of, of, of Basel, for example, as part of BCBS two four eight, and they in around that time released um, a consultation paper regarding um, interstate liquidity. And really, what it was focusing on, as, as Philip mentioned, it's the the monitoring, the management, and the reporting elements of, of, of interstate liquidity. And that really encumbers quite a lot of different components. So banks are needing to look at their cash management, their kind of big cash and liquidity profiles, um, but also understand. What that means from a risk perspective uh, so bringing in these these elements of understanding their risk framework uh, as well as their their kind of interstate liquidity cash and and security profiles as that time has evolved from 2008 obviously the regulators have become more aware of the challenges that banks face in meeting their interstate liquidity obligations uh, and really using this as a, a lever to put into to practice so we've seen the pra in the uk the, the fed in the in the us HKMA uh, and AsiaPAC really kind of take on the challenge of, of, of addressing these with banks. So putting policy in place, reporting requirements that really help banks underpin their capability around their each day. Um, and really this is focused a lot on the kind of the, the longer data liquidity, your LCR, et cetera, uh, and brought that into kind of more of a real-time intraday, daily, um, you know, near real time views. And the reason that challenge has become apparent is that a lot of this happens already within organizations, but the regulators have realized there is somewhat fragmentation to that. So the, the idea is that they're trying to bring together the kind of treasury components, the operational elements that are settling um, both cash and securities and seeing how, you know, the, the risk elements factor into the, the efficiency components of making sure that the bank is meeting its obligations, which is critical. It's understanding the, the risk mitigations that it needs to have around availability of liquidity, both where it sits in a, in a you know, bank account, in a Nostro, uh, in a custodian, in an, an ICSD, um, and how you are able then to make sure that you meet your commitments and obligations that you have. And so there's a few things that really banks are expected to do. Um, simply, they are, they are expected to understand those obligations, manage them um, you know, in terms of the, the availability of forecasts, um, ensure that they are able to meet those obligations by monitoring the different bank accounts and, and um, resources they have available, and then ensuring that they manage that to both you know, be efficient, but also ensure that they meet the obligations. What, what was clear from 2008 and as part of the regulatory change that we've seen is that obviously if a, an organization does um, find itself in difficulty, what is the ramifications that has across the market and the industry? Um, so ensuring that banks are not only looking at their own capability they're also looking at, at what happens further around uh, into the into their market and we th see things around recovery resolution which has a real link to intraday liquidity being able to manage that and then moving into kind of stressing that and understanding what could happen um, and what what actions you can take levers you can pull with your intraday liquidity to ensure that you you don't um, both harm harm your organization and and as well as the the market thanks that, thanks, thank, that, that, thanks, Simon. There's a few points that you mentioned there in terms of fragmentation and, and certainly be making sure they're pulling all these information together. We, we're, gonna get, we're gonna be back on that uh, at one point in the in the discussion. But before we get there, uh, I think that if we talk about intraday liquidity, people are talking about the ca about cash and and the cost of cash, and we're gonna start with bursting a, a myth here is that. Even if you don't have to pay for it, cash is not free, and that seems to be counterintuitive. But I'm sure Keith, I mean, will that that certainly resonate resonate with you that uh, cash is contrary to what people think. Cash is not is not free, even from from an intraday perspective. Yes, look, uh, you, you're absolutely right, and I'd like to I'd like to pick off uh, pick up where where Simon left off. Um, look, the 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 principles. And some of these principles around around liquidity management uh, by by Basel and by the BCBS papers go all the way back to back to 2008. I think even in even in when they released uh, BCBS 248, uh, the original reference was around the sound principles that uh, that was originally originally drafted in in uh, September 2008. Though they didn't sort of speak about in as much depth. But this intraday liquidity thing, I think the regulators have rightly, have rightly sort of drifted in the right direction. And 
uh, you know, from then on, left it left it to the banks to craft their own internal systems around around the efficient management. They've laid out the principles very well. I think there were just six principles what they what they what they listed back in 2008, uh, what they call the sound principles, and th- to me to me those principles are very good. That juxtaposed or read in conjunction with today's rate environment where everything is is as close to zero as is possible, and in some cases below zero for some of those currencies, including including euro and yen. Um, would sort of lead to the uh, false impression that uh, the cost of liquidity uh, is zero. Uh, if you look at the, the high-level matrix, and my, my data is maybe maybe a day or two old, we've got excess reserves at the Fed, sort of totaling 4.18 trillion dollars um, uh, excess reserves at the at the ECB in excess of, of 4 trillion euros. Likewise, for for most of the other countries, including including the RB and Australia, which ran a very nimble balance sheet, effectively all the 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 the, the provision of liquidity through different schemes for the better part of 10 to 12 years um, uh, has ended up and ended up on the on the balance sheet of the central bank. So that circulation, you know, it, it's not it's not very effective. It's not very efficient. Uh, banks, for their own part, yes, they are rightly rightly sort of concerned, rightly concerned with. Just bear with me for a minute. Rightly concerned with. Uh, uh, with managing managing their their balance sheets a little more a little more effectively, and that's why you see a buildup of surplus liquidity on the, on the central bank balance sheet, not really circulating in the economy. Come come 2020, the liquidity situation gets a little bit worse on the back of COVID, with the central banks around the world, uh, maybe not in coordinated action, but you know pumping in additional liquidity into the system. Uh, just to name a few, you saw the you saw the Fed launch. Um, 11 additional swap lines that's over and above the five they already had with uh, the BOE, Canada, Japan, Switzerland, um, and and a, and a slew of programs that that sort of span both the primary dealers market and the, the, even even to the extent of, of providing liquidity to the commercial paper market. But underpinning all of that, yes, this liquidity is not free. This liquidity has a cost attached to it. We often sort of uh, you know, mistakenly look at the the front end of the curve and look at zero interest rates and the abundance of liquidity and don't don't realize the sort of carrying cost of that liquidity. First things first, that liquidity does have a carrying cost. It's exactly there. Um, the the simplest way to look at it is the liquidity reserves that you hold with the central bank. In most in most jurisdictions, you don't earn much. At the Fed, yes, uh, you don't have a reserve requirement, but the secondary reserves or Excess reserves, as they call it today, would give you would give you 15 basis points. That's probably your opportunity cost. But most banks don't have all their currencies banked with the central bank, and even if they do, uh, most of the banks outside of the outside of the the Fed and BOE and perhaps the RB in Australia uh, give you zero on your required reserves and give you zero on your on your excess reserves. And that goes that's equally true for most of the emerging markets. Of course, we'll have to go country by country. So the first the cost is over there. The second cost is is linked there to the the you know the greater the amount of liquidity, and that would seem like an easy problem to solve. Uh, the, the best way to solve a liquidity problem is to is to um, have excess liquidity, have a, have a pool that is far in excess of what's needed, not only to cater to your end of day needs, but to cater to your to your intraday needs, and that leads to a to a balance sheet drag or a, or a cost of carry. Um, I mean, we've we've done some some um, internal analysis, etc., and realized that for every billion that we hold, this is the additional cost of carry. Look, it's not a very difficult operation. You just have to take your take your NIM and look and realize, uh, you know, for every every hundred million or every additional billion dollars that you hold in cash, that's that's what you stand to lose. Um, for currencies that you don't directly bank and don't directly clear with the central bank. You're probably holding it through the correspondent banking network. Correspondent banks are now becoming increasingly sensitive to their own cost of carry, uh, not just for not just for the negative yielding currencies. But it's not easy to take to take uh, huge amounts of cash and hold it with your with your yen clearer, for example, or your or a euro clearer, for example, because those banks in turn don't want you to hold these large balances with them. They are subject to regulatory regulatory restrictions of their of their own. The larger they grow, they'd fall into a higher category in terms of their own capital requirements. So they in turn start charging you a charge for 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 balances that you maintain with them. Um, and then the last part would I would sort of uh, distill it down to or drill it down to 
um, you know, the, the possible opportunity of deployment. Um, the flip side of that is if you maintain balances which are which are terribly small or terribly nimble, you're going to have other costs. You're going to have overdrafts, fees. You're going to have fees in the form of you know your standby lines, your contingent lines, etc., that you'd need to call upon or draw upon uh, should these should these uh, should your sources of liquidity dwindle. Now, perhaps just an additional angle worth considering is the collateral angle. Um, and and yes, today it's becoming increasingly efficient to monetize your collateral, but that also means um, idling and isolating pools of collateral, which could potentially be deployed elsewhere across other sectors of the bank and maybe in collateral swaps or in other operations. So the combination of, of uh, two and three, which is your overdraft fees, standby lines, contingent lines, or revolving credit facilities have a direct cost attached to them upon drawing and plus the, the, the fees attached to it. Or if you have collateral which is isolated, it probably means it's high quality collateral to be able to generate liquidity uh, easily, effectively, and efficiently, which itself means the return on high quality collateral now is at an all time low. In some cases, if you put in the funding cost, it could even be negative. Um, and that means that that high quality collateral from a collateral optimization point of view is not effectively um, uh, monetize. So you've got you've got a whole range of costs, cost to cost across the spectrum, and we sort of don't see that cost up front simply because we're looking at the excess liquidity and and the figures, the numbers are just staggering, right? When we when we look at what sort of ends up back on the Fed balance sheet or the ECB balance sheet or the RBA balance sheet um, versus the uh, where the front end, the extreme front end of the of the rates curve is priced. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And, and that's interesting because, I mean, if you're hearing on the one hand that from a regulatory point of view, we will have to report, we know that we have to manage efficiently the liquidity. We know that there's a cost of for, 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 for the cash. There's a cost of opportunity if your collateral is not used properly. But nevertheless, we, I mean, we just a number of institutions and a vast majority just just can't optimize that. They just can't make it happen properly in terms of management. So, so Nadim, I mean, I'm turning over to you. I mean, what? Why is that? Why can't we just make it happen properly? Why don't we? Why why aren't we that efficient or as efficient as we as we as we should be? Well, I think we can uh, split this in uh, this answer in, in two forms, if you will. One would be that you've got fragmented regulatory architecture. We talked about um, Bank of England, HKMA, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, and, and the Fed. They all have, although BCBS is the driver behind it, they all have very different requirements in, in terms of how they've implemented that. So uh, and a bank needs to be able to provide the regulatory reporting in an efficient and uh, in a timely manner. The other is all around visibility. It seems like that the, if you look at everything, this goes, goes back to what I used to, uh, to be, um, to be uh, selling in, in years and years ago in, in, in banks on liquidity solution. It's all about visibility. To have the visibility about where the pools of liquidity are sitting, where is the collateral, is the information coming on time? Are we wasting liquidity? Do we have technical solution in place? All of those. What that means is that putting a, a structure in place is, has been a challenge. Getting the information has been a challenge. And this has actually uh, turned out to be a little bit more acute in the, in the recent pandemic. We've found that the operational risk has actually increased significantly. And the, um, the operational exchange has been writing reports on this and that's, it, that's increased. So how can, you know, what, what is causing this, this uh, lack of visibility? and getting the information in a timely manner. Well, you've got multiple internal systems at any organizations, whether that's the core banking system, whether that's trading system, whether it's trade finance system, whether it's your, your, uh, your loan book, or even straightforward savings uh, accounts. Getting that information into a single place in a timely manner is a, change, is a challenge. In many cases, a lot of that is done on a manual basis. 
there may be one or two interfaces in place for you to produce your uh, liquidity position, but a lot of them, the information comes on a managed basis. It might even be provided um, on, a, on an Excel sheet, especially if the change in demand on liquidity is not in a system as such. Um, so that creates a delay in getting the information. Then on top of that is that if there is a, let's say you've, you've managed to create a very nice um, uh, solution in place where you can get the information um, on time. What happens if there's a late request of liquidity? Can that information be sent to the likes of Keith to in time so that he can actually make the right kind of funding decision and then not necessarily have a late request of uh, providing funding when he's already made the decision. So getting that data and aggregating that data is the key and the challenge around it. Now, on top of that is to be able to start looking at that data and data is key here. How can you start monetizing that data as well? Now we'll touch a little bit of, uh, on that later on to say, you know, we've got a lot of clean data. Can we use this clean data in a different way? Can we work out whether, uh, who's the, the, the big user of liquidity? Are there, some uh, regular abusers of uh, liquidity? Are they internal departments who are um, mismanaging their use of liquidity because, um, and here's the, the key, what, there isn't a penalty, there is a funds transfer price that is visible to them on this behavior. So we can start looking at behavior as well. Now, I touched upon a, on the regulatory side of it as well. So. Most banks, if not all, are able to provide the regulatory reports. Of course, they have to, right? There's no two ways about it. Um, but they have they've built manual processes around so that they can do their regulatory reporting on a, uh, on a, on a periodic basis. And at the same time, there's also intraday stress testing that is becoming key uh, for many regulators. Again, there are processes in place. They set up their scenarios. Uh, and run those processes to the game, give, so they can give their um, their um, uh, periodic in, uh, stress testing uh, uh, results. Now, what has come to pass right in the in the recent uh, pandemic is that some of those scenarios that have been built uh, in the past are not necessarily relevant. So the banks need to be able to dynamically change those scenarios get results and not wait another five, six weeks before that scenario result is provided by the by the, uh, the teams. By then, that scenario is no longer valid. That's what we've seen in the last few, uh, last couple of years. So I think it's all around getting that data, being able to aggregate that data, getting the data at the right time as well, that's key. Uh, and to be able to see with that, how can they look at the liquidity crunch points? Simon or Keith, any, anything to? Yeah, well, there's there are a couple of well brilliant points all through. The couple of points I will pick up is uh, Nadine's first point around uh, bank architecture. Look, you know, bank architecture is constantly changing, constantly evolving, which is which is excellent. But at the same time, we have a lot of legacy systems that that we've inherited because of mergers, because of uh, because of legacy. Um, infrastructure and legacy legacy architecture. Uh, a lot of these systems are designed specifically for that vertical. They are designed specifically for that line of business. And and despite the fact that they may be very good and very efficient at what they do, um, feeding that data upstream into a into an integrated or a comprehensive liquidity management system sometimes isn't isn't as good. Uh, Second, you have different parts of the organization, banks and financial institutions at different sort of stages, right? One's implementing a new system today and one's implementing a new system two years from today. Again, getting that, getting that architecture and getting the, the uh, seamless uh, sort of flow of information with, uh, I wouldn't say real time, but I would say as close to real time as is possible is, is important. So these are, these are sort of the one or two things I would talk about. The third point I would make is from a from a regulatory architecture, whether you go back to 2008 or whether you go back to 2013, the initial response 
was to cater to the needs of the regulatory uh, uh, regime. Right. We, we like we said, we can't skip out or Nadim said you can't skip out of not reporting. If it's if it's a regulatory requirement, you're re required to report whether it's at the end of the day or at the end of the month or end of the quarter. You've got to have it and you've got to have that statement well prepared for the regulators. So to me, a lot of the systems were designed primarily around catering to catering to the requirement of intraday reporting. It, it took some time, it took some thought, and it took some evolution for, for banks, including including Treasury Desk, to realize that, well, intraday reporting or intraday liquidity management can go simply beyond just reporting. It's not, it, it's it's a little bit beyond, uh, you know, integration mm. of financial architecture, integration of architecture within the banks and getting the different systems to talk to each other. Um, it's a little beyond reporting to the to the to the regulatory authorities in your country or in the countries in which you operate. Uh, suddenly, you began to realize, well, this, this could be this could be a tool. This could be a uh, an environment where you could actually efficiently manage balances, optimize balances. Uh, apart from saving costs, you could actually begin to start making some some money off it. Uh, you could be a you know a liquidity a liquidity provider, um, so on and so forth. So. Um, the, again, to sum it up, I think the, the initial response was simply uh, catering to the needs of the regulatory authorities, and rightly so, that was that needed to be done. Uh, then it went into me, to me, it went into uh, a, a real liquidity management objective, and from there, it has sort of gone into into liquidity optimization. And I will say with that, that the evolution of the outside, the external market, and the evolution of the technologies attached to it has sort of uh, shape the thinking and helped us gravitate towards uh, towards uh, you know really optimizing pools of liquidity uh, maybe maintaining uh, pools that were that were not as large uh, again in my opening remarks mm -hmm. I talked about the best way to be um, uh, to be liquid uh, liquidity efficient or liquidity solvent was to maintain as as large a buffer as you could that way you would never fail a payment you would never fail a settlement because you had such a large pool of liquidity. Uh, but then that in turn leads to the to the secondary consequences around cost and balance sheet drag. Simon, I, I saw that you. I think you, you wanted to uh, to add. Yeah, I was just, I was going to I was going to reiterate a couple of points, but from, from both Keith and Adeem, I think I totally agree with the regulatory point. I think that that we've seen we, even now we still see organisations set up in silos, right? Which is which is natural of evolutions of organisations. But you know, to to take the regulatory lens and look at it as a reporting output as opposed to actually it's a, a holistic function you're creating and that's why it's so so different right the, the intraday component of your liquidity framework is very different to any other and actually the reporting element is is really demonstrating how well or poorly you've done the managing and monitoring piece so you know organizations to, to keith's point that are kind of looking at it as an opportunity to look at their systems and processes look at the data that they have available um is really important I think you know that then we're seeing organizations to Nadim's point around stress testing really start changing that dynamic nature of it to to understand what could happen what would that mean for them and then both optimally what could levers can they pull but also to manage risk right how can they ensure that they they can continue to to perform the activities they need to um but know what what levers they have available and i think that's why it's so key i, I totally agree on the efficiency part as well just that actually by making it transparent to the business, there can be obviously a cost allocation via an FTP process. But actually, if, if you think about the commercial mind and nature of the business, you know, they are there to, to kind of drive some, some efficiency naturally um, by bringing them into the, to the forums and, to, and to, to let them understand the costs and where that cost is driven from. Um, and then you start seeing actually the true cost overall of, of trading of, of a business. Um, can really kind of start changing the dynamic a little bit, and and you can guarantee they'll be straight at the table to support that. Right, a lot of a lot of activity that impacts intraday happens there all the time, but we're just seeing it done in silo. And what we what what intraday is trying to do is bring it into a, a cohesive view, which is where the dean's point around data and, and technology comes in. You really need that capability so that you have that you know you you can then influence the business to to either through FTP or through you know the the more flexibility of your your overall inventory to make sure that you're not leaving excess and you're able to to, to use the liquidity more effectively, um, but also that you then know how to start controlling it should should um, you see an idiosyncratic or a market stress that that you need to navigate through. 
and the data availability, you know, I agree with Keith, right, near real time, will spot elements that, that you, you see and, and potential pitfalls and then allow you to, to know what action or, or management actions or levers you can pull to try and mitigate some of that. So we have point. an interesting yeah go ahead go ahead no the, the, just one point just one point to, to, to supplement what, what simon just said that the ftp i think i still think is a brilliant mechanism but along with the evolution of the market uh, i think internal internal systems and internal policies would have to sort of um, uh, you know uh, mm. march in march in stride or lockstep uh, because the ftp generally tends to work on an overnight and on a term structure basis very well we're still struggling with um, FTP applicability on an, on an intraday basis. You do see a lot of banks charge you on an intraday. The Fed does it, whether it's collateralized or uncollateralized. And I think banks are going to have to step up, particularly to, 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 to Nadim's earlier point and Simon's point around, you know, sort of fragmented internal financial architecture and what's the real cost and true cost of liquidity. Uh, so I'll just uh, sort of... Uh, uh, hold, hold, hold my thoughts over there around, around, around FTP. It is a brilliant mechanism, but it's got a little way, a little way more to go. Uh, there will be a question here, but I think we're going to tackle if we answer this question now or later on, it's regarding the, the various pool of, uh, of liquidity and uh, the multiple separate settlement center. Uh, is it better to centralize all liquidity in the US or to have local pools? In different in different time zones. I'm not sure if you want to start talking discussing that now, or maybe later one once we're talking about um, solution and platforms. I think we can we can accumulate uh, this this question to the end, um, okay. and then yeah, this because there's there's merit in both. There's merit in you know in a yeah. in a geographically fragmented pool. But let's yeah. let's pick let's up let's, take, let, let's let's pick up that, that later. So. Person who asked that question, make sure that please rest assured we'll will we'll come back to you on that. Um, but this, if we're looking at this, also one significant element that that really also changing the way people are looking at liquidity in cash is really the way with the way the overall infrastructure uh, architecture, payment architecture is, is transformed. So we're talking about DLT, we're talking about CBDCs, we're talking uh, about um, uh, also about shortening overall of the um, of the of the settlement cycle we're moving now to virtually real time i mean it's even if the correspondent banking now is 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 virtually real time I'm, I, I used to have been I don't know, I worked for swift before and now with this gpi clearly and i don't want to make uh, marketing for them but clearly you sending money across across the globe Almost in in, 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 in in half an hour, an hour, it's finished for having these uh, two or three days. So clearly, there's, there's a new dynamic. There's a new the new architecture in, in environment in which banks have to evolve with real time, with blockchain, DLT, Bitcoin, and all the digital currencies. And the shortening of a settlement cycle is really also transforming the way we're looking. We're looking at that. So maybe either Simon or Orki, one of the two, maybe you want to, um, to to elaborate on that. I, I, I definitely think you're right. It's this. Uh, it's not a, a kind of should we do anything. It's uh, we need to do something, right? It's not if but when. I think your point around the fact we're moving to a more twenty four seven kind of infrastructure in the in the industry is is just meaning that banks will need to manage this you know we've talked about the fact that organizations already and 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 you know certainly on the agenda of a lot to charge for intraday because they know they need that more dynamic nature as, as things become more apparent so the ability to manage these as new efficiencies as new products as new uh, initiatives and, and innovation takes hold within the, the industry we need to make sure as, as organizations that we're able to address those and support them within our infrastructure because the, the alternative is you end up with bolt-ons at the end of and at each end of your your kind of silo systems and, and processes that you're not able to to marry up right i think your point around swift gpi and things like swift cls now is creating great opportunity but if you're not able to integrate it well into your organization then we're seeing already people are having to manually manage some of those components hold actually more liquidity to support payment um, infrastructure or or schemes 
you know, faster payments is a great example. People hold excess liquidity to support that because they're not able to monitor and manage on a real time basis. So, you know, I, I think organizations that are, you know, sat back thinking we're actually okay, we're holding huge amounts of liquidity. There is that then efficiency point around, you know, no, no organization that, that, I, that I've seen is the same. Every organization is somewhat different because of its geographical footprint, because of its product sets and alignments. So it really needs to be understood at an organizational level, how you're going to interact with the market. What is your, you know, your entry point? How do you then manage that? And how do you ensure that you're future proofing that from a technology and, and data perspective? Because, you know, entering into 24 seven markets is, is challenging. And what, what you don't want to do is, you know, see inefficiency, hold huge liquidity, and then ex expose yourself to more greater risk um, in, in those markets that, that, you know, are potentially unforeseen. Yeah, and it's not because you're twenty four seven that the liquidity is available twenty four seven. I mean, your systems are open twenty four seven, but the access to liquidity might not always be twenty twenty four seven. And I think that that's probably a, a challenge that a lot of, of real time market and twenty four seven markets are, are facing. You might have the windows open twenty three hours or twenty three hour, hours a day. The liquidity will definitely always be locked in 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 a some in, in a few pockets during, uh, and windows during the day. Maybe Keith, you, you wanted to to add something. Yeah. Look, at this point, you know, we 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 are no longer talking about the. To, to me, we're no, no longer talking about the future. We're we're talking about now. You you've already and Simon's already referenced uh, uh, CLS CLS. Now we've talked about Swift GPI uh, APIs. Is a you know maybe maybe five years ago. People wouldn't know it, but today commercial bankers know what's an API. Um, in and and it's it's sort of difficult to say whether the private sector is taking a leaf out of the out of the central bank book or whether central bankers are taking a leaf out of the out of the private sector. But each one's racing ahead with 24 by seven. Nobody's ever talking about 21 by five or 22 by six. Everybody's talking about 24 by seven. You have uh, you have the the RBI in India. Who uh, over a period of two years took both NEFT, which is I think the National Electronic Funds Transfer, and last year RTGS Life 24 by 7. Um, the BI the Bank Indonesia is on the brink of doing it uh, next month, uh, uh, 24 by 7. Uh, the, the Fed intends doing it. That they've sort of launched Fed now. It's right now. It's, I think they've they've sort of curbed or limited the amounts, but. Uh, whether it's 2024 or 2025, that's inevitable. Inevitable, and that's that's only the that's only the the central banks on on the private banking private sector side. The banks are talking about DLT. Um, uh, DBS itself has launched a, has launched a DLT based payments company with with two other partners, and and these payments are uh, can potentially potentially take place 24 by 7 on DLT. So, so you know if I to use DLT and blockchain in, interchangeably. Then you have the the retail sector, uh, which uh, which from studies will show you you know sort of like to make their overseas payments whether to their families uh, overseas, uh, particularly particularly over the weekend. So you got to you got to sort of cater to those requirements. Again, it means you know idling pools of liquidity to cater to not only cross border but cross currency payments because you could have them working in one country and sending their remittances back and remittances today is a huge business particularly particularly for for Asia Latin and 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 the America North America as well uh, walking walking in step with them is uh, is the central banks are launching CBDCs and CBDCs have no intention of of being uh, operating according to RTGS as they are they're going to operate um, again uh, uh, online and, and, and real time. Uh, the technology will probably be DLT or probably blockchain, but CBDCs, for instance, settlements uh, is is going to be uh, not a thing of the distant future, I'd say. There are several pilots underway. Uh, Singapore's got one pilot going with four countries. Um, Hong Kong's got the MCBDC bridge uh, going with uh, with four countries. Um, yes, at this stage there are, there are trials, but uh, you know trials inevitably lead to um, lead to an interconnected interconnected world. Um, uh, this this thing these these initiatives CBDCs DLT based payments, um, Swift GPI instant payments fast in Singapore faster in Hong Kong um, is inevitably going to lead to uh, a 24-hour management for particularly for the treasury desk it's going to lead to uh, 
you know, sort of greater, greater uh, fragmentation of pools of liquidity, but there will, there will also be the need for greater optimization of those pools uh, to be able to, to transact uh, not, on, not only faster, which is what the consumer expects today, uh, but also a little more, a little more effectively. Um, yeah, on that point, anybody who makes a payment, if you do ask them how soon or how fast do you expect the beneficiary to see it today, today the, the automatic answer would be a few seconds. Um, so the gone are the days when, you know, you would sort of make a payment and it would go through the different hops through the correspondent banking network and reach the eventual beneficiary sometimes up to, up to a week later. Um, so I think a combination of technologies, um, and then initiatives both by the private sector as well as the central banks, whether you like it or not, is going to, is going to drive intraday liquidity management to the forefront. I think, I think just sorry, just to add, go ahead, Simon. Just, just really quick to add to the costing element to that. So the you know, the fact that there's there's going to be a cost associated with that, you, we're going to see that. You know, I think you make a really good point. We see a lot of, of of individuals or organizations that have kind of monthly pay cycles. So they all have you know uh, an invoice come in and you've got thirty days to pay it. On day thirty, they want to press a button and within milliseconds that payment to have been received by the, the beneficiary. I think we're going to see an evolution of that. That actually within that 30 day period, when is the most efficient point to make that payment, both on the kind of customer or client's level, as well as the, the kind of institution from a liquidity perspective. And um, we'll see a way of optimizing that cost to ensure that that's the best way, as opposed to pressing a button and a millisecond later, it, it was being received by the beneficiary, even though you've had 30 days to pay it. You know, that's, that's the kind of mindset change that we're gonna see. And I think without answering the full question, but going back to that pause, of liquidity you need to understand what are your levers that you have available where are you where are you sourcing your liquidity from what are your obligations and what is the most efficient way to run that because to follow the sun model if we're suddenly in 24 7 markets will not be that you can pass your liquidity over from asia pack to, to europe then to north america you know we, we have to see a, you know a difference in how you manage your your global liquidity i think that's what's clear and and and, and to your point i think that it's not only limited to what we call in cash because it, it's also anything of pure cash trade and the like it's also securities related if you're talking about corporate actions i mean there's there's also a need now to have instant payment of that that the that corporate corporate the corporate action proceeds will flow directly to the to the older of the of the security and not being held for a few days or a few weeks uh, with the with the paying with the paying agent, and I think that on to, and and you're absolutely right. I think that on many aspects, the expectations from both the corporates, the financial institutions, and the retail are really changing the way the the, the money is going to flow. And that money could it be linked to trade, linked to securities transactions, uh, or, or or anything else. Uh, remittance, to your point, Keith, is also something extremely extremely important. Um, or just or, or just supporting your family across the globe when i'm sending money to my daughter who's, who's, uh, she's in, in the uk right now for studying when well, you want to make sure the money arrives arrives on time but all of that puts of course pressure on the on the liquidity and uh, and on the banking system not me on, on my own i would love to but that 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 that, that doesn't happen but clearly uh, as a whole it, it does so much so that means all, if we are all hearing that the difficulties of the cost of cash, the, the new technology, the new architecture, the reporting requirement, the fragmentation uh, from of uh, the internal fragmentation and, and the regulatory fragmentation really requires institutions to have a robust technology infrastructure, robust systems and, and, and tools to address that. So, I mean, turning over to you, Nadim, uh, and, and so that that's really your that's your, your, your area. Um, what is required now for, for institution to really be able to manage that efficiently and really to get where, to the state of the art of, uh, of intraday liquidity management? And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so listening to the comments that uh, both Keith and Simon have made, it's, it's evident that in order for, um, for, especially with 24 by seven demand on liquidity coming through, it's evident to, to be able to look at the existing data and 
uh, and predict the, the, the need on liquidity. I don't expect Kate to be sitting 24 seven in front of his laptop or his, uh, his smartphone looking at his position saying, I, do I need to uh, optimize this liquidity now? So you need to start looking at the data. How can that, that data be used to predict the demand on liquidity? Can we start using uh, machine learning tools or artificial intelligence to start predicting forecasting the, the uh, and create those models on the liquidity itself. Now, and the, the, the next step on that would be, okay, what are the new technologies in terms of financial technologies coming as well? There's a discussion around intraday repos that are coming in the market. It's very, uh, in its, very much in its infancy, but that's something that would help manage that liquidity. First thing is to know what it is, then obviously keep, you, you mentioned you need to be able to op optimize it. So there, there's a, another element coming through. Now, if I look at the, the first point on the machine learning side of it, if we, at a, any given point in time, when you look at your uh, intraday liquidity position, you have certain number of predicted cash flows that have been settled, but you still have a, 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 quite a few commitments left uh, let's say at 11 a.m., you've got quite a lot of, lot of uh, commitments still left, then you need to know when would those unsettled cash flows will occur. So is, our, is that settlement time likely to create a crunch point during that the rest of that day based on, on the potential delayed receipts, the available liquidity on lines, et cetera? So if you have that predicted settlement time of receipts, you can also predict the settlement time of the payments. So potential missed payments, delayed payments. If it gives you an early warning indication to say, I need to call X, Y, Z bank or counterpart to say, there's a large payment coming through. Are you going to make it? What time are you making it? Or if there's a likelihood of that uh, payment to be missed, can we uh, can keep going and go ahead and um, and uh, allow for additional liquidity uh, for that purpose. Now, on top of that, again, looking at data as well, um, there is a, a, a market trend to look at, again, stress testing in a more BAU, BAU process as well. So to create those stress tests to understand where, again, I keep using the expression liquidity crunch points, it's quite critical in finding that out to understand where are the vulnerabilities in the in the system itself and create those uh, remedial management actions it can also help you predict again what would be the delayed payments and if there are time critical payments that's a key issue for you as well as a, as a bank um, and in as part of the stress testing uh, capabilities you need to be able to say what happens to my liquidity if one of my counterparts is under stress or if a bank delays payments or fails to uh, settle. Do I know whether any of my Nostra agents uh, is likely to cause, uh, is, is likely to fail or is there too much concentration on one or two agents? Again, if you have tools available, this is where the analytics tools come into it. So again, looking at data, looking at the, uh, what, what, uh, analysis you can gain from that particular data to make it a more of a BAU process. An earlier point was made that, you know, in faster payments, whether uh, there is a, uh, the, you know, how do you manage your liquidity, just leaving large chunk of cash is just no longer acceptable. That's passive management. Yes, it may keep you safe and, and meet your payment obligation, but it's not the best treasury management uh, process. You might end up even be charged for that. I mean, some institution might actually be charge you, charging you for leaving for Absolutely. leaving long for leaving long balances. In the past, people were very happy to have long balances of their clients on their account because they could make money out of it. Now they they, oh, yeah. they, 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 they that's no longer the case. So, I mean, conscious no, you're of time. You're right. <laughs> exactly. You're absolutely right. Uh, well, I was working for another organization, as that was part of my role to say, look at where the the uh, large corporate uh, and and uh, and banks left their their cash sitting around, and the, there was a massive conversation at that time. This is going back a few years. Do we start mm -hmm. charging them? Of course, everybody's doing that now. <laughs> yeah. 
no, no, it's it, it's it's very true. I mean, I mean, conscious of time here. I mean, we are um, eight minutes to to the uh, to the end of our uh, our our conversation. I think that we could go on for probably another another hour. Um, probably need to take take a second a second a follow up session in a couple of in a, in a few weeks so that we can continue the. Uh, that great conversation. But I would like just maybe to address the two questions that we have received on the um, the chat here. So back to the to the pool. Is it better to centralize all liquidity in one location, and or to and have or to have local pools in different time zones? That's the first question. And the other one is that is there an informal or formal group initiative among major financial institution to have a gold standard of intraday liquidity pools? But that is an interesting one, and I think that. That probably steps probably on the toes of some of the of, of institutions who are providing these uh, liquidity management solutions uh, across for for their for their clients across multiple multiple jurisdictions. But if we can maybe start and, and maybe Keith, I think that you were uh, keen to answer that question in terms of the single or multiple liquidity pools. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at the first one. And um, let let me let me start off by saying in a, in, a, in an ideal world it would be it would be ideal to have a single pool of liquidity at, at a single single bank that that, that that's ideal. Um, if I draw a slight parallel to what to what uh, Nadim talked about earlier, uh, even from a from a correspondent banking point of view, um, th there's a preference to have uh, a single currency at a single bank. Now, of course, there are there's a, there's the flip side to that coin, where from a from a resolution planning point point of view, from a contingency planning point of view, you'd probably need two or three banks. But when you start to spread it out, for whatever reason, your pools of liquidity start to get fragmented. So what would tend to happen is you'd invariably see balances during the day accumulating in one account for for whatever reason, because there's a certain pool of customers that remit its remits its uh, balances into account A. Well, is you tend to make payments from account B, and so therein begins the op optimization. Let me, let me sort of transpond that example back into the to the original question. The preference is always to have a single pool of liquidity with a single clearing. Now, very few banks in the world can actually do that. The Fed is probably a prime example, and the ECB comes in a close second because the Fed operates 21 and a half hours a day. So from the time you open in Singapore at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, you can effectively do Fed clearing, and that's fine. The It starts to get a little more complex where maybe you know a bank in southeast asia doesn't have direct access to the fed and has got to go to maybe one in some cases two correspondent banks second point is the fungibility of the currency now dollars by and large is fungible but a dollar let's say in in, in indonesia or in vietnam may not have the same fungibility of a, of a dollar in singapore hong kong london or, or the united states itself so the currency is fungible but uh, local regulations around capital control and two-way two-way both con convertibility and fungibility kick into play, which means it might sometimes be a little more efficient, again, depending on the currency, depending on the pool of liquidity, to have clearing uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a central block. Uh, look, uh, the HK Chats is a prime example, and you know, some of the overseas countries, I believe, can, can link in through, uh, through correspondent banks, and that helps with a with pool of liquidity. Uh, but if you ask me for a purest answer, the purest answer would be to have one central bank, one universal time zone, and a centralized pool of liquidity. But therein, after that, the sort of the complexities kick in around around convertibility, the complexities kick in around uh, direct access to the Fed. And in, in the case of some other central banks, whether they, they operate for a period in, in, in excess of um, you know 18 to, to 21 hours covering covering Sydney, or, or even Auckland in New Zealand, all the way to to uh, Los Angeles in the the U.S. West Coast. Yeah, I I just just quickly agree with that. I think Keith's right. I think that we're seeing an evolution, right, in, in organisations use their liquidity more efficiently. I think they've, they've been pushed to do that. I think things like IHCs and and uh, recovery resolution has meant that organisations have had to address that in terms of how they operate. They're kind of more global. Or re versus regional components, 
So I think, you know, you need to understand the nuances, as, as we said. So there are going to be challenges. I think it's really important that you understand the markets that you're in, and especially for, for the, 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 the attendees on this call, is to understand, you know, how from a overall liquidity, not just cash and, and payments, you know, how do you ensure that that inventory is managed well? What are the nuances from a regulatory perspective, markets perspective, um, you know, infrastructure, right? The, the, the settlement kind of components and, and trading elements that you have. Um, to ensure that you know the levers are there, and I think that's really important. That the levers you have are so critical, and I think Nadine made the point that there aren't many. Right at the moment, we're seeing efficiencies and opportunities around intraday liquidity markets, repo, FX. You know, they're not really there yet, so there are limitations to what levers you can pull. One is really working with the business and the inventory management that you have. Thanks, Simon. Um, now, I mean, that this, before I hand over to you, Nadim, for, 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 for closing remarks, um, I'm not sure if there's an informal or formal group initiative among financial institutions to have a gold standard of, of liquidity pool. I think there's probably, my understanding is that there are definitely initiatives on the standardizing the data and the way these data are exchanged among institutions, therefore streamlining the way these data can be uh, processed within, within organization. But I'm not sure there's a formal initiative to standardize the way liquidity pool are managed. I mean, anybody here can have a view on that? There's certainly nothing formal. I'd, I'd say there's there's conversations that happen, and even way back in 2008, I know that there was kind of certainly the broker dealer community were talking around how because they were already seeing the pinch from the liquidity generally they were receiving from clearing banks, but it wasn't anything formal. Um, and I think there is a, a a big difference in maturity that we see with organisations from you know the low end of just meeting the regulatory requirements to to almost what Nadim is talking around some of the AI and machine learning components. So because of that vast difference of maturity, it's very hard to get organizations really to align on, you know, how do we make this more efficient as, at a market level as well as an institutional level. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Maybe Nadim, over to you for the, for your, for the, final, for the final comments and uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Philippe. So what we've heard is that there are challenges in getting the right data at the right time to make the right decision. To be able to operate with confidence within the set guidelines and have tools in place to generate the alerts where needed. It's not just about having a liquidity position at various points in the day, day but have it as near real time as possible. Having a period, uh, periodic stress testing capability can help meet regulatory requirements. Yes, we, we address that, we agree with that. I think everybody would uh, resonate with that. But it's becoming evident that uh, the ability to carry out dynamic stress testing uh, on demand bet better uh, provides a position to make a decision uh, and through changing scenarios and metrics. Finally, and I won't take very long, finally new technologies such as cloud-based solutions have become the norm. Yeah, two years ago, people were just uh, thinking uh, twice about that. Similarly now, use of AI, AI and machine learning is no longer restricted in the innovation labs. It's being discussed at, at, at uh, commercial bank uh, meeting rooms as well. Uh, so it's the, the, the point with that is that it's going to be more and more important to be able to predict the behavior of liquidity usage. With that, I close my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadim. And it was indeed a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, to have a conversation with you today. Uh, for the attendees, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed that as much as, uh, as I did. And um, again, if you believe that uh, some of these topics that we've uh, talked about today uh, are of interest to you, please do not hesitate to reach out to either of us or, or to, uh, to, uh, to my colleagues uh, or myself at ASIFMA, if you believe that it's something that we as an organization and, and a trade organization, we could help the community with. On that, I wish you all a very good, uh, a very good evening or rest of the day for the London-based ones. Thank you very much.